YouTube, welcome back to another History Teacher Reacts video, Mr. Terry, or I feel like DJ Terry here today, as I continue my quest for historical knowledge found on the internet. A little bit of a different background today, uh, the game room office is getting uh, kind of remodeled here, so we are getting dirty, we had to clear out the walls, we got paint on our hands, but I want to make sure I get out of video. So I had to put away a lot of stuff, my speakers are gone and had to change the whole arrangement. You get to see the mic now, had to throw on some headphones, but we're gonna make do because I really wanna keep making videos. I love doing this. So we're gonna continue on with this. All right, today's video comes from our awesome patrons uh, over at Patreon because they voted on this. So in last week's poll, they voted on this. It's Athens versus Sparta, the Peloponnesian War explained in six minutes by uh, Epimetheus. So this is gonna be cool because I love, um, for I love ancient history. I'm very interested in Greek history. I think the Athens-Sparta, I don't know, just idea is such a unique thing. The city-states and the clash between the two, um, you know, most famous of the city-states. So the Peloponnesian War is, again, a fascinating one uh, because it clashes some ideologies. It changes Greece big time. And the context, even the greater context, is really interesting because... This uh, war only became about a generation after the Great Persian War. So the Persian War is famously what kind of united Greeks for the first time and started to see themselves kind of as a, as a common kind of Greek people. But amazingly, after about a generation or so, uh, Greece basically has a civil war with Athens and their allies versus Sparta and their allies. And there's a lot I know, or at least I think I know about this, but I want to let the video get in and I'll chime in um, if... I feel like there's something worth talking about or something interesting to me. So anyway, we'll get started here in just a sec. Now, if you would like to get involved in future polls, very simple. You can just join our Patreon community. It starts at a dollar a month. It supports the channel. There are other tiers, too, if you see um, within the last month or so, some other cool tiers with some different types of rewards and things coming back there. But anyway, uh, but last thing before I begin, the original video link is down below. So make sure you click that, get that uh like, subscribe, give it the view, and all that stuff so we can support these awesome channels. All right, let's go ahead and get started. So six minutes. This, six, this is this uh, is six minutes and 21 seconds, so they're sticking to it. All right, so we got. The war between Athens, leader of the Delian League of Allied City-States and Colonies, against Sparta, leader of the Peloponnesian League. I'm sorry, I already paused it. But I think there's a great teaching point here. You see when this map, with this map, they threw up a physical map of Greece. Now, one of the things that has been talked about is why, why did the Greeks go with a city-state sort of organization rather than like an empire? Because there's no real Greek empire. Uh, as compared to like something like Rome or in, in China and empires and stuff like that around, uh, around their time. Well, if you look at this map, you see how divided it is geographically here. There's a lot of mountains. Greece is made up of tons of islands, lots of, um, and, and lots of mountains. Not a lot of major rivers either. So what I'm getting to is this. It's very hard geographically to be unified in Greece, right? It's about these narrow valleys and staying more around the coast and things like that. So it's harder to connect, to travel, and to communicate. So what geographically it lent itself to is rather than one large unified community more divided communities because of the geography they're a little bit you know um they get very divided it's very jagged mountains and stuff like that not a lot of mass agriculture so it lent itself to this but they're also close enough where they can have some uh, common characteristics that all the greek city states had but anyway that's why city states and not really empire pitted a powerful navy against one of the most dominant infantry forces in history. Preceding this conflict, Sparta. Athens had defeated a Persian invasion force at the yep. Battle of Marathon. A decade later, a much larger Persian invasion force yep. suffered major setbacks and defeats at Thermopylae. 300, 300 Spartans. Spartans famously fought to the last man. Hellas. Then at Salmis, the Persians were dealt yep. a major naval defeat against the Athenian navy. That was, uh, I don't want to get into too many of those specific battles because it's the Persian War, but yeah, Salamis was a, similar to Thermopylae, was something where the Greeks used their geography to really help them out. And what I mean by that, at Thermopylae, if you saw going up there, uh, let's see, right up there, okay, you can see up here, it's hard to see my mouse, I know. But this is one of the only ways that really you can get uh, troops from land from the north to south. 
But there are areas in here with very jagged, narrow canyons uh, that, that come through. And of course, the Greeks know this very, very well. And one thing the Persians had over the Greeks was a way, way, way bigger army, probably like 10 times the size of their army, if not probably way more, depending on what sources you read. But uh, the Battle of Thermopylae took place because the Greeks, you know, Spartans and the other Greeks, of course, were there, got them to a point where they would have to funnel their troops. And why that's important is if you have to funnel your troops into a smaller area, you're not going to be able to be have as many people at one time fighting. So that is uh, where famously the, the, the Greeks, specifically the Spartans there, kind of made this stand where they're able to um, dish out all kinds of casualties here because they took advantage of that situation. Now, Salamis was the same thing. So if you go forward, right around here, there's an island right where the swords are covered there. And there's a strait of water right... Right there, again, that's how you get to Athens. And the, to make a long story short, um, the Athenians, they got the Persian fleet to go into a much more narrow strait of water where they were able to fight at more equal numbers. And one thing the Greeks got go going for them more than the Persians, or really anybody in the world, is their navy. If you can get them one-on-one, -on -one, toe to toe or even just slightly outnumbered, the Greeks are going to come out of top. And with that, that kind of was the final kind of nail in the coffin for the Persians, and uh, they're not really going to be back. And finally at Plataea, the Persian army was defeated on land, before downsizing and eventually abandoning the campaign. For so the many things that we'll talk century, about, but look out for Both states video. followed an anti-Persian policy, and supported any anti-Persian activities in the eastern Mediterranean, allowing for an intermittent peace to exist between Athens and Sparta. In order to fight the Persians at sea, the Athenians Delian formed League? the Delian League. Good. By exercising this will be on the test. control over the members of the League, Athens converted this coalition into an empire, exacting tribute yeah. from its members. It's like, it's like Athens probably would have loved to be really like like an imperial ruler of all the Greeks. Never had the ability to it. Nobody would have wanted that. I always kind of think of this with the Delian League, which again is made, it's a it's a United Nations of Greek city-states, if you will, and, and, and yearly they pay, they pay um, to Athens, who was the economic center of Greece, who would use those funds to keep basically a standing force and keep Greece in a state of military preparedness because they're assuming the Persians are going to come back. Well, the Athenians were kind of using this to build themselves up and get more power over their city-states. I like to say it, it's like they were creating an empire out of Greece without the Greeks even really knowing it before they, and once they kind of, like I said, once they, the Greeks kind of figured it out, the other Greek city-states, that's when they're like, uh, oh crap, Athens is actually looking to take us all over, time to stand up to them, thus the Peloponnesian War. But uh, we also know, and maybe they'll get into this, but um, the funds that were supposed to be used for a lot of this stuff was not necessarily going to that, and it's going to other projects like the stuff being rebuilt at the Acropolis, like the Parthenon. From the money extracted from her client states, Athens built herself into a city that was the envy of the Hellenistic world, and a fleet of 300 triple-banked galleys. Each of these triremes was manned by a crew of 170 professional oarsmen. The city-state of Corinth had been the dominant maritime power prior to the Persian Wars, and as Athens' power grew, her navy outnumbered Corinth's fleet 3 to 1. I always felt like other city-states like Corinth always got kind of shafted because there were another, there's, some, there's a bunch of really, really amazing, powerful ones, city-states, but they always get overshadowed by Athens and Sparta. So I'm glad we're getting some throb to places like Corinth. And began to incite rebellion in her colonies and encroach on its trade routes. In a series of small conflicts lasting 15 years, known as the First Peloponnesian War, Sparta opposed Long Athens war. and defeated the Athenian army in one non-decisive engagement. While Athens continued to expand her naval power, one significant development during this period was the rebuilding of Athens' walls on a grand scale, with a long causeway connecting Athens with the port city of Piraeus, allowing Athens to be fully supplied by sea. Sure, so you can see if you take Athens, uh, you're going to have to go through walls. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, because Athens was basically destroyed by the Persians. And some of that kind of intentional. They kind of abandoned the city to make it really look like the Athenians were leaving, like retreating. But really, it's like at Salamis and other places, they were able to kind of like like do it like a trap. But it's pretty ingenious design because um, this is at least a couple miles, I believe. 
that this wall goes. So you can see it extends to the from the main harbor to, to there. So you would have to, if you were going to try to drop off troops, you know, close to Athens and avoid a wall, you're going to have to battle through a harbor that would have been, I would assume, just constantly under, like, uh, you know, protection. Even if an invading army would destroy the surrounding countryside and farmland. This hostile period ended with the so-called 30 years peace between the two city-states that would last for less than half of its intended duration. Huh. Despite this peace, hostility between Athens as long and Corinth as you continued. Hope. And in 431 BC, Corinth successfully convinced Sparta and the Peloponnesian League to declare war what cool the shields are. with the goal of ending the burgeoning Athenian Empire. The first phase of the Second Peloponnesian War, commonly referred to as simply the Peloponnesian War, is, the big is known as the Arcadamian War, where Sparta the pursued Ardalus. a policy of pillaging the countryside around Athens in an attempt to provoke a pitched battle. If you're looking for some good primary sources from from Sparta, about Spartan life and stuff like that. You should you can read uh, Kik Archidamus' stuff. It's it's one of the primary sources I give in my class. Uh, we I have them compare King Archidamus, basically talking about the values of Sparta, and then the uh, famous funeral oration of Pericles, who was the leader of Athens at this time. And you know they, they talk about their different values and stuff like that. It's really um, really good, and you can find short excerpts uh, excerpts. I really I encourage you to do. The Athenians had anticipated the Spartan strategy and had organized a continuous flow of grain shipments from Egypt and colonies on the Aegean and Black Sea coasts. You can see that the, the alliances, so you can see there's alliances. It, it's pretty much like everyone's got to pick a side. You're going to pick Athens or pick, pick Sparta. But you can see it's it's um, very varied. But you can see Athens can definitely controls a lot of coasts. They go all the way up to the... Uh, let's see, all the way up to basically up to the Black Sea. Right where today would be like Istanbul, Constantinople. So you get the isthmus there, and then um, you have a lot of the coasts with Sparta and Corinth really um, connecting with a lot on land there. The Athenian strategy was to blockade the Peloponnesian Peninsula from any trade and supplies while opportunistically raiding Sparta's allies. While initially the Cut Athenians from each other to be maintaining the upper hand in this asymmetric war of attrition that had been carefully planned for years by the Athenian statesman Pericles. The population from the surrounding countryside poured in behind the safety of the Athenian walls. Not to sound like like a, a total Athens Homer here, but if you have to read one source from Greece, when you talk about, I don't know, I guess anything, probably read Pericles' funeral oration, which is a big speech that he gave in uh, on an anniversary of, of, of fallen soldiers and because it's it talks about uh, early democratic ideas it's it's basically the first written thing we have about of anything democratic and it's it's pretty cool um to to check out but it's kind of got on as one of the most famous speeches in history so if you have to read probably one thing read his speech it's readily available Hopefully you'll be able to read more. So you can read stuff from Sparta, and of course the earlier stuff. You can get, you know, the the, the pre-Greek stuff, the Mycenaean stuff, with Homer and that. But if you're talking about classical Greece, probably read, um, read that. In the early stages of the war, this had been taken into account beforehand, and wealthy Athens had more than enough food flowing into the crowded city to feed everyone. What had not been taken into account was tainted grain shipments carrying plague, which rapidly spread through the overcrowded city. Initially, the city was resilient, inspired by the charismatic rhetoric of Pericles. An estimated one in four Athenians succumbed to the plague, including Pericles and his sons, there it is. before it had run its course. The plague. If you thought the plague was new to 14th century Europe or 14th century the Earth, that is not true. There's been other ones. And this was probably the thing that doesn't get talked about most about what led to the outcome of this uh, this war but also being so like walled in and that plus they're a trade city so there's stuff coming in and out plus you are walled in so it's kind of this mix of both was a perfect place to be able to uh, have the plague spread plus the surrounding areas over time were surrounded by the spartans and their people so it, it basically they just waited for them to die off so pericles one of the Maybe the most famous plague victim ever. At the height, 
Mercenaries refused to fight for Athens, and even the Spartans ceased to Heracles. campaign near Athens for fear of catching the plague. Ironically, the masterfully planned Athenian blockade of the Peloponnese had protected Sparta and its allies from receiving any of the plague-tainted grain. The Athenian survivors adopted a much more aggressive strategy, greatly increasing the raids and building fortified outposts along the Peloponnesian coast. The Helots, Spartan slaves that outnumbered them ten to one, were encouraged to run away to these outposts, which put pressure on Sparta to defend the home front. This phase of the war ended with the 50-year Peace of Nicias, which never really went into full effect. The Spartan, um, the Spartan societal structure. Okay, now Sparta usually, again, big people think about a military power. And a common question I get, and I like to bring up at least in my classes, is, is whether it's been asked or I just in, in, um, interject with it is, why was Sparta such a militarily devoted city-state, nation, whatever you want to call it? And it's an interesting feedback loop because it's this. They, they were very good at fighting. And when you would fight, as was common in the, uh, in, in the ancient world, when you had uh, people that surrendered or just people that didn't die that you defeated in war, it was common to enslave them. Now, if you are very successful at that, you're going to find yourself with a lot of slaves because the more people that you, again, conquer, the more slaves you're going to get. But also, the more slaves you get, the more the threat is in your nation, city, whatever, that you can have slave revolts because, generally speaking, people don't really like to be slaves. And if you're like Sparta and you win a lot, all of a sudden, the percentage of slaves in your society is pretty huge. And... As far as I know, okay, uh, you can, uh, maybe there's some more stats on this. Sparta may have had the highest slave percentage of, of a society of a, a nation, city, state than anyone I've ever heard of. Okay, if you, if you know of more, go up. Because, yeah, like they said there, at its height, it was about 10 to 1. 10 slaves to 1 Spartan. Now, that means that <laughs> when you have 10 to 1, it sure seems like a slave revolt could be very, very possible. What that means is you are always in, if you're in Sparta at home, in a constant state of military preparedness. So all of a sudden, you need to have a society that is well-trained and basically could fight at any moment. Now, if you have 10 to 1 slaves, that means those people are doing a lot of the work, right? They're farming and doing that stuff, which then frees up Spartan, specifically men, to be able to basically devote themselves and their whole life to military training. I won't get into all this stuff because it's it's basically like a 30-year training program from, well, not 30 years, but from 7 to about 30. And then even after that, but pretty much full-time military training and military service. So it's this feedback loop because the, strong, the more slaves you have, the more militarily strong you have to be. And the stronger you are militarily, the more battles you're going to win. And the more battles you're going to win the more slaves you're going to get. You see how this is like a spiral that just kept going and going and going till you get something absurd like having 10 slaves to one Spartan citizen. That is why the Spartans are such a military um, uh, society because they have to be? Question mark? With both belligerents raiding each other through proxies from the onset and eventually directly, in 415 BC, the Athenians devised a plan they believed would bestow upon themselves an overwhelming advantage. The conquest of the fabulously wealthy city-state of Syracuse on the island of Sicily, who along yeah. with Athens and Carthage, controlled the lion's share of Mediterranean trade. Led by the young charismatic Athenian statesman Alcibiades, the expedition ended in disaster, with Athens losing over 10,000 hoplites and two-thirds of her navy. Ships could be rebuilt, but the 30,000 professional oarsmen could not be replaced. Yeah. This was followed by further disasters. Sparta freed 20,000 Athenian slaves in the city's silver mines. Yeah. Athens then raised the tribute from her vassals, which caused widespread revolt in Ionia, mm -hmm. for which this final stage of the war is named. The Athenian general Alcibiades, fearing retribution for his failure, switched sides and fought for Sparta, who began <laughs> to receive vast sums of traitor. He switches sides. Benedict Arnold here. Boo. Money from the Persian Empire, who viewed the Athenian Empire as a greater threat. With this, Sparta built up its fleet and combined with its Corinthian allies, decisively defeated the Athenian navy at Aegospotami. 
Athens now, effectively without a navy, so, was besieged by Sparta and promptly surrendered. And if Athens doesn't have a navy, then they can't compete. Spartan hegemony over the Greek world would be short-lived. Its most precious resource, Spartan warriors, had become far too low to maintain an empire. And after a series of smaller wars, in the aftermath of the Peloponnesian War, Philip of Macedon, the father of Alexander the Great, right was able to north. conquer the decimated Greek city-states. Yeah. Okay. All right, awesome. Great video. I love the, the short kind of six minute thing with the, the great animations. I'm trying to remember if I've covered this channel before, but I love it. Six minutes, but packed with detail. I actually learned a lot more specific things about the little wars within the war. Um, that was a lot of things new to me. I knew it was long, you know, it was long, it was decades long, but the little pieces of the war, that was cool to add there while still being fairly general to keep up on. That was awesome. I'm glad that he put in the last little note about what this did to Greece long term. So Sparta wins this war, okay? But Athens won't be destroyed. I mean, Sparta could probably have burnt it to the ground and be gone forever, but they didn't. And I think the, the kind of reason for that is what the goal of Sparta all along here was not necessarily to destroy Athens, I mean, that could be something, but it's not necessarily priority one, okay? Priority one was that Athens needs to be taken down to a level where they can't act like they are the imperial throne of Greece. They want to go back to the way things used to be, right? They've, they've had a rivalry for a long time, but you never had that like attempt that Athens was basically doing at trying to dominate and control the entire Greek world. They, they don't want that. So, I mean, yeah, it could be something they were going for to destroy it, but it wasn't the primary goal. They just want Athens to be taken down a, a notch there. I would also say that there's still things about Athens that the Spartans did respect. They understood that they were important. Yeah, they had different cultural values and stuff like that, but I think they did, still did understand that. Now, Athens will never be the power it once was. It will remain, however, basically the cultural center of Greece, as what Pericles and his uh, close confidant, uh, uh, Aspe uh, Aspasia, who uh, he worked with, she, with them together, made Athens, again, a, a cultural center of arts and, uh, uh, um, yeah, arts and drama and, you know, the whole, the whole, like, theater scene, comedies, writing, all that stuff flourished. And Athens will remain that, but it will not be the, the power in the other ways that it once was. Now, one thing that's for sure is these decades of war on the city-states weakened Greece to a new low, which, of course, made them susceptible. And then that's where uh, you get the story of Macedon. So while all these city-states are out here battling around down here, okay, up north here on the fringes of Greece, kind of Greek cousins, if you will, is the growing state of Macedon under Philip and then Philip II. Um, the, and then who will be the father to Alexander the Great, who is an interesting story because the, the Macedonians were never really seen by the Greeks as like full Greek. They kind of were like the awkward cousins you kind of barely acknowledge at Thanksgiving. But the Macedonians want to basically be that, especially Philip, like wants to be that. Um, really respected like the classical Greek culture, which is why, for example, Philip had Aristotle, who was probably the most famous teacher in all of Greece, to personally uh, tutor his son Alexander and groom him, wanted to conquer Greece, and then of course go further into actually taking over the greatest empire of the world at this time and the long enemy of Greece, which was Persia. Okay, so that's more of a story another time. We know Philip doesn't actually achieve that. He goes, he conquers Greece, but then he's assassinated, thus uh, promoting Alexander in his early 20s to basically taking over and completing what his father had done. But, so a question could be, would, would um, Philip have been able to conquer Greece, right, the other Greek city-states, if Greece had not been hurt so bad by the Peloponnesian War? I know it's something to discuss. You have to look at exactly what the effects were, but it's something to at least think about. But nevertheless, it changes Greek history, and that is what that's when you're truly going to get an empire with 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 Greece. I mean, it's it's going to be although Alexander's empire was was short lived, it will um, Greece will be unified at least until the Romans show up. So, 
But that's a story for another time. All right, awesome video. I know I talked a lot there. And if you're still with me, <laughs> thanks for doing that. I wanna apologize if any audio or video stuff was weird. I basically just threw together what hasn't been packed up of what I could get, at least to get a video going here. So it's not real professional here, but hopefully it worked out at least enough that it warranted watching. <laughs> All right, again, thank you to the patrons who uh, pledged and voted for this video um, this week. You can join, link down below if you want to join, um, is going to be there. Other links are down below, Discord, Teespring, um, you can, uh, the gaming channel, my new gaming channel, which I guess it's still new, about a month old, is linked down below too. Uh, one thing I've been playing a lot of is Assassin's Creed Odyssey, which is set during this war. It's set during the Peloponnesian War, so it's very fun to do that, as well as, as other games that I get involved in there. Um, also, if you go over to our Discord server, you'll find info if you're a gamer in the uh, Minecraft server that... The community has set up a history-themed Minecraft server if you're a gamer. I know they're having a lot of fun there, creating cool historical things. Go to join the Discord for more info on that. All right, with that, uh, make sure again that you checked out the original video. It's linked down below, and we'll go on into here, and we'll see you next time. Bye.